Welcome to the Scarlet 1 to 90 Leveling Skills Guide. In this guide, we'll cover all of your skills as you train to be a really bad Sonic cosplayer better than the rest of them, but also hopefully kill your enemies along the way. Watch as you go from this... ...to this. This series is framed in the mindset of players completely new to Final Fantasy XIV or the MMO genre in general, or generally just still inexperienced. In that same vein, this will merely be an overview of the actions and how to use them. Optimal rotations are better left to their own in-depth videos just due to how much complexity is involved in perfect openers and overall rotations. This is not meant to be a purely optimal guide. If you wish to be optimal at level cap, there are further places you could research your job on. We will, however, be crafting rotations as we go to help new players understand what goes to creating openers and give them a fold to push themselves into being able to do it on their own. The goal is to drop players in on the ground level so they can make strides to improve themselves. All tooltips will be shown at the level cap for each section. Level 50 for A Realm Reborn, level 60 for Heavensward skills, level 70 for Stormblood, level 80 for Shadowbringers levels, and level 90 for Endwalker skills. I also recommend all players add Sprint and Limit Break to their hotbars, both found in the General tab of your Actions menu. And as for how my hotbars build, it'll make sense at 90. Just put skills on your hotbar in a way you feel comfortable using as you are leveling. Everyone has their own way of doing things. If you want more info on how I set up my UI, check the description or the card in the corner for a video on it. And keep the following in mind, patches can change jobs still. Be sure to check the description for any patch notes for minor potency changes or skill changes or any other special notes. With all that out of the way, let's begin. Scarlet is a fairly complex healer, but makes up for this with flexibility. Your toolkit is strong and allows you to react to different situations as they arrive, though you're rewarded better with planning your actions ahead. This partly is due to the nature of being a shield healer. Your heals mostly include some sort of secondary shield that absorbs damage or otherwise mitigate how much you receive. You have resources to spend and a pet to manage, further increasing the complexities of the job. The resources are spent on several skills, meaning you have to decide how to use them, or whether you can squeeze out some more damage instead of healing. Figuring out the right tool for the right job is one of the key features of Scholar. It isn't very straightforward sometimes, but the reward for figuring it out is powerful. To obtain the Scholar job, you must first reach level 30 and complete the level 30 Arcanist quest. Additionally, complete the main scenario quest, Self-Management, which is level 20 in the story. Return to the guild and the quest should be there for you. And, because Arcanist is the DPS companion of the summoner job, I am not going over those skills here. If you want the level 1 to 30 skills for Arcanist, go check out the summoner guide. Let's go into the finer details of each skill now. We'll start at level 30 with a couple already. This includes some roll actions. Repose, Asuna, Swift Cast, and Lucent Dreaming are skills you already have. Your roll actions are important for one reason or another. Put them on your hotbars if you want to succeed. I will not be going over them here though. In the corner or in the description is a guide for these skills. I recommend checking it out. But as for our normal skills... Level 20, Maim and Mend. This is not affecting any real playstyle change or anything like that. Base damage and healing are up by 10%, which is basically just how the game is expected to be balanced. Numbers are also so small at this point you likely won't even notice what 10% is. Just enjoy the base upgrade before you even got the job. Level 1, Ruin. With a 1.5 second cast time and costing 300 mana, this is our basic attacking spell. It does 150 potency of damage to an enemy. Healers should do damage. When you aren't healing, nobody at all needs help, do some damage. You aren't helping the party if you're just standing there doing nothing. And you'll find yourself able to put out a lot of damage as you get better. Level 26, Corruption Mastery and Bio 2. This is an upgrade to a weaker bio skill that you won't see unless you go below level 26. Both you use the same way though. Bio 2 specifically costs 300 MP and places a 400 potency dot on a target for 30 seconds. Dot being damage over time. Dots work on a server tick, meaning they do damage every 3 seconds. Divide that by the timer and you get 10 ticks of damage for a total 400 potency dot. That's well and above the damage for Ruin. It only takes 12 seconds to be better than Ruin. The only issues are that it does no damage on hit, and it does have that 12 second requirement. In lower level content, enemies can die pretty fast, so you need to get used to when and if enemies are going to die fast. You will quickly see enemies get stronger though, and you'll be putting this on as many enemies as you can. 
No point in using Ruin if enemies don't have Bio 2 on them. Just don't reapply it when it falls off if they're about to die. The big benefit of this, though, is beyond the damage, no cast time. This can be used on the move. If the enemy doesn't already have Bio on them while you're moving, spend that movement time applying Bio. If the enemy or all enemies have Bio already applied, it's a bit less useful, but tanks will quickly start trying to pull multiple groups of enemies, which will involve a lot of movement. This is free time for dotting. Level 4, Physic, and level 30, Adloquium. Adlo here is your first job quest based skill. Do your job quests, or else you end up losing half of your toolkit. Some of your best skills. I will not be saying when a skill is quest locked from this point forward, but in the top left is the denotion of quest based skills. Just do the quests, don't stop doing them. These two are your main healing spells, your Kier 1 and Kier 2. Physic is a 400 potency heal costing 400 MP. It takes 1.5 seconds to cast. And Loquium, meanwhile, is a weaker 300 potency cure for 1000 MP, with a 2 second cast time as well. However, the benefits come in with the additional effect. And Loquium comes with the shielding effect for 125% of the heal, or essentially a 375 potency shield. Assuming you heal and the shield is entirely spent, that's a 675 potency heal. Further, heals can critical hit, and a crit Adlo applies a second shield, also worth 375 potency of healing that stacks with the first, for a 1050 potency heal, made even stronger by the nature of critical hits being stronger. Otherwise, Galvanize cannot be stacked. If you place a shield, then cast Adlo again, it will attempt to overwrite the shield that is already there. Stronger shields overwrite weaker ones, and Sage ones always seem to overwrite Galvanize due to the job mechanics. The point is, you can't spam Adlo to try and give someone a bunch of shields. Only the biggest one will work. Due to this, you will end up needing to properly space out any uses of Adlo, be it with a DPS spell or two, or a Physic if the tank needs even more healing. At least until high levels when enemy DPS is much higher, but by then we will have many more tools. Point is, you want to get used to how healing with Adlo feels, and using Physic as little as possible. Typically, the mana cost isn't super worrying, and healing the tank with Adlo means you heal and delay how long it takes for them to start taking damage again. Make sure you're healing for the full healing potency too, and not just using Adlo for only the shield. And if you still run into mana issues, use some Physic too, just to bridge the gap as needed, but that's only if you're having mana issues. Though, before a fight, you can use Adlo for just the shield. Place Adlo onto the tank before they pull any enemies. Your mana will all but instantly regen since out of battle mana regen is extremely high. This gives you a bit more leeway before anything starts to happen to the tank, so you can get your bearings for the fight. Keeping up with them with sprint for trash or placing your fairy in bosses. Every little edge you get can help you overcome healing. Level 12, Resurrection. With an insane 8 second cast time and 2400 mana cost, this revives a fallen player. Be it your fault or someone else's, people will die. Things happen, mistakes happen, lessons get learned. This will be one of those lessons. Before committing to a raise, make sure everyone else in the party will survive while you are stuck standing still. Then, start casting and get the dead player up as soon as you can. The best case scenario though, is that you use swift cast. This turns the 8 seconds into 0 seconds. You still have the recast time, but you're able to move and get back to healing the rest of the party much sooner, or mentally preparing for healing the player when they get up. You do need to heal them after they get back up. They do not have a lot of HP after raising, and a stiff breeze will knock them right back down. You'll need to give them at least something before any form of raid-wide damage comes out, or before they get themselves killed again. The good thing is, there is some leeway that you can inform players of if they don't make use of it. There's about 5 seconds of invulnerability after raising a player. Almost nothing goes through this invuln, meaning you have time to heal. The issue is, if that player does any action before you can heal them, the exception being movement, that invuln will end prematurely. If they immediately act after raising and just die again, tell them about the invuln, and maybe you'll save yourself and all future healers, a bit of trouble. Aim to keep people alive, but sometimes it's just not possible. Make sure everyone else lives, then fix whatever mistake happened. 
Level 4, Summon Eos and Summon Selene. Both of these do the exact same thing. Pick the one you like more. It costs 200 mana to summon either of them with a 1.5 second cast time. Your fairy is essentially a permanent heal over time or hot. She has a basic heal called Embrace with a 3 second recast time. It heals 150 potency to a target that is essentially random. Yeah, she does have AI directing her on who to heal based on current HP values and who is lowest, but it means you can't guarantee it happens on who you want it to happen on. In Dungeon, she'll mostly just embrace the tank since they're taking most of the damage. But the moment something happens to you or an ally, she will most likely swap targets to that damaged ally as they will have lower HP percentage than the tank now. This is mostly something to deal with in boss fights, which is why in all non-dungeon content we will see even less obvious effect from Embrace. If nothing else, her constant healing means you don't need to worry when a DPS has a small amount of damage taken. Some healers overreact at the smallest bits of damage and think you need to keep players at max HP at all times. No, that's really only for the harder content, and usually not even then, and your fairy will do a lot of work topping off players. But for some unfortunate things about her that make it even worse, fairy potency is only about 90% of your potency. So Embrace is more like a 135 potency heal. And also, if you die at any point, when you resurrect, you have to re-summon your fairy for her to do anything. Otherwise, any dungeons before level 30, she essentially solo heals. Sestasha, Copperbell, etc. She will do most of the work for you. Don't ignore HP levels, especially if the tank is doing big pulls, but low level stuff, you generally don't even need to heal, giving you room to get used to doing DPS. Additionally, your fairy comes with the pet hotbar like Arcanist. The only three buttons you should be concerned about are heal, place, and stay. Heal is for after using place or stay. In dungeons, after you killed a boss, if you placed or stayed your fairy, she will not follow until you hit heal. If you do not, when you get too far away, she will disappear and need to be resummoned, which is also another way to make her heal, but less quick and useful. Place will give you a placement icon, selectable with X on controller or clicking, making her move to that location and remaining there until told otherwise. Stay will cause her to stop moving wherever she currently is. These are important for getting her in a good spot for reaching everyone in the arena. Not all of her abilities have immense range, meaning you need to try and position her in a decent spot. Right behind the boss should reach every ally and the tank with any buffs thrown out. This is extremely important if just because the fairy skills you do get are too good to ignore. They lose a lot of their impact with poor placement, usually due to helping fewer allies than it could have with good placement. Every boss fight, trial, etc., try and get your fairy near the center or at the boss. Then, after it dies and you move on, heal to bring her back. Level 20, Whispering Dawn. This is an action to order your fairy to do something. On a 60 second cooldown, you tell it to use Whispering Dawn. It has a 15 yarm range based on your fairy's location, giving every ally in range an 80 potency hot for 21 seconds. In total, that's a 560 potency heal, which is really good. Instead of working to try and heal the entire party after some damage, just use Whispering Dawn to have that taken care of. If there will be no major damage coming soon, that's plenty of time for Whispering Dawn and your fairy's Embrace spam to clean everyone up. Hots take some time to work, but when you have time for them to work, let them. And this doesn't need to just be used for only when the entire party is damaged. In Trash Pulls, you can use this for just healing the tank. If the tank's HP is slowly draining, Whispering Dawn can help your fairy keep up with the drain for the duration. Just be ready to send your own heals too, and add low here or there. This skill points to a really important bit of positioning. Embrace will get basically anyone from anywhere in an arena unless you're in 24-man content. Whispering Dawn has a much smaller range. This is where place will be of extreme importance. Try and place your fairy in the middle of boss arenas, or otherwise a middle point between everyone in your group, so that it hits them all. In trash pools and using this for the tank, stand close to them. There's many reasons why you want to stand near the tank, not on top of them, near them, and this is one of them. This will ensure Whispering Dawn actually hits them, instead of missing completely because you stood far away. Placement is very important. 
and the sooner you get used to it, the better. This covers the toolkit you start with as a scholar, though. It isn't overly much, but it's a big change from a DPS. If you have experience with other healers, it should be easier than otherwise, but the difference is, say, between this and White Mage get wider as you progress. Level 35, Sucker. This is our AoE, Area of Effect, healing spell. With a 2 second cast time and costing 1000 mana, this heals all allies in a 15 yarm radius of yourself. It is a 200 potency heal with an attached shield for 30 seconds just like Adlo. The shield is worth 115% of the heal or 230 potency of shielding. The ideal usage of this is either before starting a boss to negate the boss's first raid wide attack or between back to back raid wides. The first one damages everyone, so Sucker will heal and prevent some of the damage of the next AoE. Generally though, this is a quick way to bottom out your mana reserves without smarter usage. Trying to spam it to heal will just continually override the shield, wasting the stronger part of the heal. Make sure to use both parts where you can, and make sure everyone actually NEEDS a heal to begin with. Remember, your fairy is probably going to start healing people up without you needing to do anything. And to top it off, this does not stack with Adlo. The stronger shield takes priority, and both are galvanized. Sucker cannot remove Catalyze, but it likely won't refresh the shield on anyone with Adlo on, which is a good thing in that case. Level 38, Ruin 2. With no cast time, Ruin 2 does a weaker version of Ruin, 140 potency of damage instead of 150. It also has the same 400 MP cost. At this early level, this gap in power is tiny, but later on the gap increases quite a bit between Ruin 2 and your main attacking spell, so the sooner you get used to it, the better. Ruin 2 is like I mentioned with Bio 2, for movement. You can't stand still to cast, but you might as well do some damage. If all enemies have Bio, you still need to be moving, hit Ruin 2. And since it's only 10 potency less right now, in bosses you're still doing relatively the same damage. But again, as you level, Ruin 2 becomes relatively worse, so get used to using Ruin 1 more than Ruin 2 while you have the chance. Level 40, Maimon Mend 2. Same as Maimon Mend the first, but now 30% base power up. This one you might tell the difference, but it's still intended balancing. Level 40, Fey Illumination. On a 2 minute cooldown, this tells your fairy to cast Fey Illumination. Just like Whispering Dawn, this has a 15 yarm range from the fairy. This increases the power for heals of anyone affected by the buff by 10%. Further, they take 5% less magic damage, which usually means all raid wide attacks. This buff lasts for 20 seconds. If nothing else, 5% magic defense is nice, but given you are likely hit by the buff, you can now do 10% stronger heals for the duration. Throw out a sucker to top people off before whatever the next attack is. Add low on the tank for coming tank busters. It's pretty hard to use both effects to their fullest power right now, but we will be getting more abilities that help us better combo them, and also later things just generally do more damage and more mechanics. Till then, don't be afraid of using this skill for only one of their effects. One effect is better than none. Level 44 is our next roll action, sure cast. Level 45, Aether Flow and Energy Drain. With this, we have a new gauge. On a 60 second cooldown, this restores 20% or 2000 MP and grants you Aether Flow 3. Aether Flow are these diamonds, and there are three of them, hence the name. You need to be hitting this button on cooldown. In addition to Lucid Dreaming, Aether Flow is a HUGE mana gain. If you're having mana issues at this point, either the tank is doing some difficult things or you are massively overhealing. If it's the latter, that means you have entire control over whether or not it remains an issue. And that's with still using Adlo as your primary healing spell. The only issue is Aetherflow can only be used in combat. Outside of combat, you just leave it be. Upon hitting 45, your only use of Aetherflow is Energy Drain. This is your Aetherflow dump, what you use just to spend the stacks before Aetherflow comes back off of cooldown. Again, you want to be using Aetherflow on cooldown, so spend every stack you can when it's about to come off of cooldown. On a near instant 1 second cooldown, Energy Drain deals 100 potency of damage to a target and heals you very slightly. Again, this is just for the dump when you can't be using it on better options. 
the heal isn't worth it, and the damage isn't super high, but it's better than nothing if Aetherflow has come back from cooldown. Level 45, Lustrate. Also with a 1 second cooldown, this is the much superior option for spending Aetherflow. This restores a target's HP for 600 potency of healing. That is almost as big as an Adlo, but with pure healing. Rather than needing to revert to using Adlo or Physic, use Lustrate to cover most of the healing when you have stacks. This isn't going to actually cover all healing, especially as you level up, but for picking up a tank after a big tank buster or constant damage of trash pulls, you're going to be able to be extremely comfy with your healing and have plenty of DPS time still. Level 46, Art of War. Become Kratos with an instant cast and 400 MP cost. Art of War is our AoE attack. It does 150 potency of damage to all enemies in a circle around you. This is finally what we've been looking forward to, slapping that ground. The fairies, the healing, none of that matters. All that matters is slap that ground. Okay, unfortunately all that other stuff still matters, but having an AoE massively ups our damage output in groups. On three or more enemies, this is even stronger than a full potency bio too, and tanks still want to be pulling more and more enemies. Wall-to-walls are very common, so you can hit a good 6 to 8 enemies or even more with a single strike. That's 900 or more potency each ground slap. You can always mix in DPS with all the healing, but just make sure you're doing enough healing to keep everyone up. We have the final roll action at 48, being Rescue. Level 50, Sacred Soil. With a 30 second cooldown and costing an Aether Flow, this places down a bubble with a 10 yom radius. You place it just like you place your fairy, so if you want some practice, that's a safe way to do it with no cooldown. The bubble remains placed for 15 seconds. Anyone standing inside of this bubble will take 10% less damage. In dungeons, this isn't the best skill. It can be useful, but the uses aren't perfect. Two uses are trash and for bosses. In trash pools, you can place Sacred Soil down on the tank to reduce their damage for 15 seconds. The question that gets asked as a result of this, though, is will this prevent more damage than a Lustrate will heal? In early dungeons, maybe up to even Stormblood dungeons, the answer will likely be no. As a result, Lustrate ends up being superior. In bosses, you can place the bubble in a decent spot for your allies to all stand in to take less damage from a raid-wide attack or other damage. Will this save you a heal? Probably not early on. Though just like the trash pull example, it might later. In 8 player duties though, where it's basically all boss fights, Sacred Soil sees a much stronger use. Reducing damage for 8 players in fights with much more common raid wide attacks and typically harder hitting attacks is simply better in obvious ways, and your current other options are a single target heal and a single target attack. So make sure you start trying to use this in good ways at the least, and later on it will get better. But also the good uses of Sacred Soil also ignore the existence of Whispering Dawn, which will cover the healing of those big hits. The biggest issue though is all those players who just never stand in the bubble. Just why? It's, it's right there. Just stand in it? Why are you bards like this? This is your fault, Jericho. Anyway, this is about where I would go over the openers for jobs, and Scarlet doesn't have one yet, or much of one ever. Start the fight, put up your dot, put up your Aetherflow, spam ruin. You can also consider spending all of your energy drains as part of your opener, but a situation where you can just spend all your energy drains doesn't come up all that often. You'll spend those Aetherflow on your healing spells for the most part. We'll go over one opener at level 70, but otherwise this is just going to be all entirely focused on the actual skill usages. So let's just go right into Heaven's Word and see more of that. Level 52, Indomitability. With a 30 second cooldown, Indom restores 400 potency of healing to all allies within 15 yams. It costs an Aether Flow to use. This is outright superior to Sacred Soil, and if you have to choose between one and the other, choose Indom. They both have short cooldowns, so being able to constantly use both won't be too much of an issue. Anytime your party takes significant raid-wide hits, hit Indom instead of Sucker. If this is an even bigger hit, you can later use Sucker to heal the rest and shield the party for the next enemy AoE. But on the average between this and Whispering Dawn, you should have AoE healing covered in most cases until you level up. 
And since this is instant, if you can't wait for regen of Whispering Dawn to do its magic, use this first. But if you can use that Aether Flow for, say, an extra lustre that isn't purely overheal, make the call. Learning Fight Pacing will help immensely for things like that. Level 54, Broil Mastery and Broil. This is a couple of boosts. Ruin is upgraded into Broil, which does 220 potency of damage to a target. Ruin 2 is boosted to 160 potency, which leaves a 60 potency gap. I did warn you that Ruin 2 will eventually be much worse. Broil is that point. Also very significant is Art of War being boosted to 165 potency. That's 15 potency per enemy, and makes Art of War just that much stronger for AoE. Level 56, Deployment Tactics. On a 2-minute cooldown, Deployment Tactics will take the Galvanize of a Shield on a player and spread it to all allies within 15 yarms of that target. The length of the shield is the same length as the shield at the moment you hit Deployment. It will not spread Catalyze if the player has Catalyze on them. This is an extremely powerful tool, especially for pre-pull sorts of situations. Before starting a boss, put Adloquium on the tank. Then, deploy that shield onto everyone. Everyone will now have that 335 potency shield. The moment the boss does a raid-wide attack, it will not affect the party, or do very little damage. Now obviously, if the boss does not do a raid-wide attack within the first 30 seconds of a fight, deployment won't do anything for you but most bosses will raid wide to open fights at this point. Mid-fight, it becomes a bit trickier. If you place Adlo on the tank, the shield is probably going to shrink with every single attack. The later you spread it, the less it is worth, if there's even anything left to begin with. And the game won't refund you the skill just because the shield was spent. If you hit deployment and the target does not even have a shield, the skill will just be gone. So typically, mid-pull, you will cast Adloquium on yourself. Run to whatever the closest point is between all party members is, and hit deploy. Just be wary of the usual stuff. We also could be using Indomitability instead. It costs an Aether Flow, but that's better than the cost of an Adlo both in mana and DPS loss. Or Whispering Dawn, which is even stronger than Indom if the Hot has the time to work. If you have no Aether Flow, no Whispering Dawn, or Indom isn't enough, then yeah, go deploy. Later on in levels, you will likely need to supplement with more tools, typically, so learning this trick now is a good option, even if not needed. Level 58, Emergency Tactics. On a very short 15-second cooldown, Emergency Tactics will cause your shields to be immediately converted into pure healing at the cast of your next spell. So hitting Emergency Tactics, then casting Adloquium, will heal a target for 300 potency, 375 potency, and then an additional 375 potency if you get a critical hit, which then would also turn Catalyze into a heal. The same will happen for Sucker, a 200 and 230 potency heal. As the name says, this is essentially an emergency button in most cases. You have plenty of other ways to heal well without putting it all into shielding. In Trash Mobs, you can alternate Adlo and Art of War so you don't overwrite any shields, while still healing the tank if you have no Lustrates available. But then there's those times where people take unexpected damage, and you need to rescue them from their fate. Hit Emergency Tactics and throw them an Adlo or Sucker if it's the whole party. From there, you can clean up the rest if there's anything else to fix. Another Adlo or Sucker for the shields, or other skills in the kit as needed. You will almost never plan to use Emergency Tactics. As mentioned at the start, Scholar likes to plan their skill usage in Trials and such, rather than pure reaction. Emergency Tactics is the opposite, being React instead of Preempt. It will hopefully be a button you never use, but you will. Try and save anyone from low HP, and then protect them. Level 60, Dissipation. With an immense 3 minute cooldown, this has you eat a tasty meal of Fairy. Eating your Fairy, you gain a full stack of 3 Aether Flow for free. Your healing power is also increased by a significant 20%. Just be wary that when it says healing magic, that does not mean your Aether Flow abilities. It only means stuff marked as a spell. This removes the fairy from play and lasts for 30 seconds. Your fairy will resummon itself when the timer runs out. You cannot manually resummon the fairy. And finally, this can only be used in combat. Before hitting this, make sure you have no need for Whispering Dawn or Fey Illumination, since they are based on the fairy. But consider the following. 
Embrace is basically a heal over time for 150 potency per tick. 30 seconds of being missing is 1500 potency of healing. 3 eighth of flow spent on even just Lustrate is 1800 potency of healing, plus 20% extra from the Dissipation buff. Any other healing you need to do in this 30 seconds is just extra potency on top of that. Also, uh, Fairy Potency is actually a lie. It's actually lower than what it says by a little bit. But back to how good that extra healing power is. And while this is the quick and obvious show of power, it can be any of your Aetherflow skills. There's one straight effect, but how you use those Aetherflow is up to you. Indom for an AoE heal. Sacred Soil to protect. A Lustrate for the tank. Dissipation removes your backup and makes some of your skills unusable for the duration, but the benefits outweigh the negatives. The negatives don't even exist if you already use the fairy skills anyway. This also slightly works as an emergency button, but it's still better to be proactive with it. Toss away your fairy for big healing that even emergency tactics can't beat. But given it's that strong, using it with intent is all the better. Places you know you don't need the fairy, or can make good use of the extra aether flow. The fact your fairy gets eaten seems scary, but it's absolutely not. You have so much extra control and should be more than willing to use dissipation and experiment with it. More work for you doesn't mean harder work. If you aren't overcapping your aether flow, use dissipation about on cooldown, or when you think you need an extra boost of healing. But that's Heaven's Word and that caps it off, with a very powerful skill. It might not be able to be used often, but when you do, you're gonna have a huge boost to power. Then there's some very strong moves ahead as well, even with the first skill of Stormblood. Level 62, Excogitation. On a 45 second cooldown, you just got the best skill in your toolkit. It costs 1 Aether Flow and places a buff on a player that lasts for 45 seconds, the same as the cooldown. When this timer runs out, or when the target falls below 50% total HP, they will receive an automatic 800 potency heal. Though if the player hits 0 HP without going below 50%, the heal will not apply. But given how powerful it is, that alone should be enough for you to want to use it. That's already quite a bit stronger than Lustrate, while having even further benefits. Throw this on the tank on cooldown, and you don't even need to think about healing them until after Excogitation is spent. When they hit 50% HP, they will automatically be burst healed by Excog. As you level up, you'll need to pay more and more attention, since HP bars will drain faster and the heal provided will be worth less comparatively. But even then, you can count on Excog to be a fire and forget skill for a while. You can heal before healing is needed, and unless the tank is just not taking damage for those 45 seconds, it's guaranteed to heal quite a lot. And then it can be used just like Illustrate if it comes off cooldown mid-combat. If the tank is already low on HP and it comes off of cooldown, use it like an even stronger Illustrate. If they're already below 50%, it auto-activates. Just, it's a very good skill. The only good thing about Scholar, I'd say. Level 64, Broil Mastery 2 and Broil 2. Broil has upgraded to Broil 2 and now does 240 potency of damage. Ruin 2 has also been boosted 20 potency again to 180. Enjoy the animation, nothing more to say. Level 66, Chain Stratagem. On a 2 minute cooldown, this causes a single target to take 10% more critical hits for 15 seconds. In trash mobs, obviously this kinda sucks, but on bosses this is a very big boon for the party. Timing this well with the entire group's big burst phases and openers will give them that much extra an edge. You also benefit from it, especially if everyone else is buffing you. Other than how we're using it in an opener, there's not much more to say about it. Use this on cooldown, even in trash mobs if you think it will come off of cooldown before reaching the boss. Bosses take priority since it won't help AoE all that much. Level 70, Aether Pact. Before we talk about Aether Pact, we have to talk about our new fairy gauge. Look at every single one of our Aetherflow spenders. Spending an Aetherflow with a fairy active will now grant us 10 fairy gauge. The gauge caps out at 100, so more than three full uses of Aetherflow will cap out the gauge. Aether Pact causes your fairy to stop acting and tethers a single player up to a 30 yom range. This essentially means the target is focus embraced for the entire duration, but instead of Embrace, it's Fey Union, healing 300 potency every tick, which is still every 3 seconds. 
The first issue is, again, roughly 90% of your power is a fairy, so 270 potency heal in reality. The other issue is, every tick is now costing 10 fairy gauge, and only lasts as long as there is gauge. It's way stronger and much more reliable than the random Embrace cast, since you can force her to target the tank and just the tank, but also extremely limiting with the rest of the toolkit. For example, Dissipation will give you 3 Aether Flow, but you will not gain any fairy gauge because you just sent the fairy away. You will only gain gauge when she is on the field. Aether Pact works like a temporary stay. She will stop moving wherever she is and channel the tether. If you forget to hit Aether Pact again, now Dissolve Union, she will not move. Even if you press Heal, she will not cancel the skill and get moving. But it will work if the target is outside of the tether's range, but your position when you hit Heal is within range of the target. Conversely, if you press Whispering Dawn or Fey Illumination, this will cancel Aether Pact, and she will not continue it again afterwards. You will need to reselect the target and press Aether Pact again, if you want the tether to keep going. This is double the power of Embrace, but using it seems relatively simple in terms of how or why. Trash pull on the tank is constantly being chunked with damage, Aether Pact so she heals the tank better and doesn't randomly target the DPS, who took a very tiny hit and doesn't need to be healed. Boss fight with high constant damage, or to supplement your Aether Flow? Aether Pact. It's a decent hot, if a bit limited, but keep using it as your gauge starts getting up there. It's definitely worth the jank for the extra power. Just again, be wary of the accidentally turning it off with, say, wanting to use Whispering Dawn for a party-wide AoE heal. But now we're 70 and have changed stratagem, which means we have more than just hit enemy between healing. But the big issue is... well, this is what's recommended for a Scholar opener. This strikes a balance between going full DPS and being ready to heal. The Aether Flow given Aether Flow... well, that's a mess of a sentence. The first three energy drains can be thrown off for free damage. Dissipation you can hold onto for any healing until the Aether Flow comes off a cooldown. When Aether Flow comes back, you can throw any of your remaining stacks with Energy Drain just to make use of them if you did use Dissipation. Even in some of the harder content though, this may be too much Energy Drain, which will mean you just use less Energy Drain. The start of fights tend to be pretty low threat, so throwing out this many Energy Drains should be okay, but be prepared as you get into harder and harder content to use less of it. And due to how loosey it is for an opener, I'm only going to do the karaoke opener for it. Karaoke openers being me saying the skill names at the exact moment of the skill going off. If I cut myself off, well, that's just how it goes and how fast the skills are being used. Pre-pull, summon a fairy, broil, bio, aetherflow, broil, broil, change stratagem, broil, energy drain, Broil. Energy Drain. Broil. Energy Drain. Broil. Broil. More Broil. So that's the opener, and it's kind of unquestionably awkward. So let's just move back to learning skills and how to use those skills. Shadowbringers brings us plenty more to do. Level 72. Corruption Mastery 2. Broil Mastery 3. Biolysis and Broil 3. Ruin 2 increases to 200 potency, yet another increase. Bio 2 becomes Biolysis, Royal 2 becomes Royal 3, and Royal 3 is a 255 potency hit. Pretty beefy. Biolysis is a 700 potency dot over 30 seconds. That makes it stronger than Art of War on 4 targets, assuming the full duration. Though technically that doesn't change how you use it anyway. When the tank is running, Biolysis. When they stop running, start spamming Art of War, and obviously heal in between. Level 74, Recitation. This is a combo skill on a 90 second cooldown. Your next Adloquium, Sucker, Indomitability, or Excogitation will be free and guaranteed to be a critical hit. That's no mana cost, or no Aether Flow cost. The buff lasts for 15 seconds, so you can also prepare for it a little bit ahead of time. Two of these are superior options. Recitation Excogitation is an 800 potency critical hit. That's a stupidly strong heal and doesn't even cost you an Aether Flow. It should negate any and all tank busters the tank survives but goes below 50% for, or even just generally super good healing, like during trash pulls. 
If X-Cog was already fire and forget, a guaranteed critical hit is extra fire and forget. And if you're going to save an Aetherflow, you're going to use it on X-Cog and not Lustrate. The other main option will be Recitation, Adloquium, Deployment Tactics. Sure, you can Recitation Sucker, but an Adlo will be stronger, cost the same amount, and even give a Catalyze to the tank. Technically, this is even stronger than X-Cog, but you have to spend time casting, don't get an extra 10 Fairy Gauge, and still have to use Deployment for the most effect. Both are pretty good options depending on the situation. Just make sure you completely avoid the sucker use. Indom could maybe be an emergency party-wide save. And because X-Cog is a 45 second cooldown, every other X-Cog should more or less line up with being comboed with Recitation. Level 76, Fey Blessing. On a 60 second cooldown, this orders your fairy to do an AoE heal. It has 320 potency and a decent 20 yom range. Keep in mind, your own Sucker and Indomitability are only 15 yams. Decently short cooldown, good potency. If you think you need a quick heal for your party, throw out Fey Blessing. Instant acting, unlike Whispering Dawn. Further, you can use it during trash pulls for the tank and the tank alone. 320 potency is stronger than even a tick of Aether Pact. And the cooldown is so short, there's no reason to hold on to it for the upcoming boss. 60 seconds isn't that long, which makes it pretty spammable in addition to Indom and Whispering Dawn. Just be wary of Aether Pact. Once again, this is something that will end it prematurely whether you wanted it to or not. Level 78, Enhanced Sacred Soil. Sacred Soil is now actually better than Lustrate. The cooldown remains the same, it still only reduces 10% of damage, but now it has a regen effect for 15 seconds. That's 500 potency hot total, only 100 less than Lustrate. Reducing damage by 10%, that will definitely offset the 100 potency of healing difference. In trash pulls, use this before throwing out any Lustrates. Slow a death rate, some of the healing done for you, and just guaranteed to be more effective. In boss fights, all the same uses apply, but now you won't need to heal as much afterwards. Much of it will be done by the Sacred Soil. But assuming people stand in it, that will always be an issue. Even with perfect placement, you may still have players standing outside of it you'll have to baby. Ultimately though, this regen alone is enough to make Sacred Soil a lot more usable in a general sense. Between XCOG and Sacred Soil, there's going to be a lot less Lustrates now. Just make sure you aren't doing something like using Sacred Soil to lower a Tank Buster and only a Tank Buster, when there's also a Raid-wide attack you could block soon after. If you can block both with the Sacred Soil, do that. But if you have to pick one or the other, Raid Wides, especially in 8-mans, are much better uses. Level 80, Summon Seraph and Consolation. On a 2 minute cooldown, this turns your fairy into a super fairy, Seraph. It lasts for 22 seconds, with some of that time spent on the animation. This upgrades Embrace into a new skill, Seraphic Veil. Other fairy skills technically change, but the rest of them do not change like Embrace does. Seraphic Veil is the same healing potency, but also now gives the healed player a shield with the same amount as the healing, lasting up to 30 seconds. This essentially is a double potency version of Embrace, so long as the shield is actually spent. Aether Pact and Fey Blessing cannot be used during Seraph, but in exchange, she has Constellation. Summon Seraph becomes Constellation after activation. Constellation is a 250 potency AoE heal to all allies within 20 yams from the fairy. This heal will also apply a shield for the heal amount. This is also a skill with charges, meaning you can use it twice in a row. The shields sound bad since, hey, you have Sucker and Adlo, but these will stack with your shields, not fight each other. Seraphic Veil and Consolation will fight each other though, since your fairy can't stack its own shields infinitely. Watch out when using fairy skills when swapping to Seraph. If you hit Whispering Dawn and Summon Seraph at the same time, Whispering Dawn will not activate. It will not work, but the cooldown will still be applied. This is an unavoidable bit of pet jank. If you want to be using a fairy skill, then swapping to Seraph, make sure you use at least one casted spell between the two actions to prevent ghosting. Seraph is for when you have those really heavy damaging parts of fights. Multiple raid wides back to back, mechanics that hurt back to back, anytime you need that little extra push to heal on top of the rest of your toolkit. 
The buff to Embrace is nice, so long as it gets put on the tank, but it still has the same randomness issue. Constellation tends to end up being the main use. Two 450 potency AoE shields, assuming both shields are spent, is plenty enough to make Seraph worth it. And since you can still use Whispering Dawn and Fey Illumination, not all of your options are cut off. If Seraphic Veil gets used properly a good number of times, the benefits are all the sweeter. This is one of those skills that seems really good but feels extremely underwhelming, but that's how Shadowbringers ends. But Endwalker shall see us go from fairies to hedgehogs. Now, due to the nature of healers and it being hard to show how a healer works outside of content, I'm going to show Endwalker Dungeons like I've been showing for all the other content. I'm specifically choosing footage that is as little spoilery as possible, but if you want to entirely avoid spoilers with Endwalker, come back after 90 and beating the main story. Level 82, Royal Mastery 4, Art of War Mastery, Royal 4, and Art of War 2. More number buffs! And animations. Royal 4 is 295 potency. Art of War 2 is up to 180 potency of damage. The gap between Biolysis and Art of War has been reduced, but the general usage has not changed. Biolysis to dot stuff while on the move, then Art of War when they stop moving. Heal is needed. Also, Ruin 2 caps out at 220 potency now. Level 85, Enhanced Healing Magic. This is a bunch of small but nice healing buffs. Physic, while being your worst option, is slightly better at 450 potency. Embrace is up to 180 potency, as is Seraphic Veil, being Seraph's Embrace. Adloquium Shield is now 180% of the healing power, and Sucker is up to 160%. Things are hitting really hard here, so even a little buff like this can be of big help. Though those shield buffs are pretty big. Level 86, Protraction. On a short 60 second cooldown, this places a buff on a target for 10 seconds, and has two effects. The target will have their max HP be increased by 10%, and will be healed to that increased amount. So if 10,000 max HP to 11,000, the target will be healed by 1,000 HP. Secondly, healing actions will heal 10% more for the duration. Doing double duty, this lets you heal up the target, almost exclusively used on tanks, to a higher HP amount in preparation for big tank busters, while healing them after is also made easier. Or if there's high consistent damage like in trash pulls, you can keep the player alive a little easier as you send heals their way. Plus, it might be relatively small, but that 10% max HP heal is still a heal on the target. This can easily combo for pre-pull or mid-pull deployment tactics. A 10% stronger shield that is now going to be on all allies? That's pretty good if you ask me. If you can get it on the tank for any catalyze, all the better. But if the boss isn't cast locked, which seems to be almost every boss at this level, you just end up wasting some of the Adlo's power if you don't get a crit. And recitation, Adlo, protraction, deployment tactics just seems like a bit overkill. But preparing for big, deadly hits or fighting back against heavy constant damage? Protraction is just good to use constantly. Level 88, Enhanced Deployment Tactics. Simply reduces deployment tactics to a shorter 90 second recast time. Spreading Adlo to reduce big damage in those 8 player fights can happen a bit more often and sooner. If mechanics are 100 seconds apart, now you can negate both of them with spread low. Level 90, Expedient. The skill causes you to put on a kid Sonic Halloween outfit and run at super speed! And by that I mean on a 2 minute cooldown, it grants all players within 15 yams of yourself 2 buffs. Desperate Measures is a 20 second buff that reduces all damage by 10% for 20 seconds. Expedience has already been nerfed, lasting only 10 seconds. This causes all players affected to run at the same speed as Sprint. Do you know what else allows everyone to run at sprinting speeds for 10 seconds? Sprint. Can you hear me now? Good, because you're 49 minutes into a video and I hope you could hear me by this point. While there's always the chance the speed boost saves people, this can be more a detriment than a boon in some situations. Be careful of the specific content you are doing. Some hard fights in the game require a bit of precision, or riding against death walls or edges of arenas you can fall off of. A player who is not expecting to be sprinting can end up flying off the edge by real no fault of their own. If you're all near the middle of the arena when it happens, they will have time to recognize what is going on. If they're at the edge, by the time they realize they're sprinting, they may already be off the ledge. 
The expedient buff is best used during mechanics that involve a lot of movement, but using it specifically for that buff is outright a waste. If it's not a mechanic that has a lot of movement and a lot of damage going out, it's just a huge waste. Now, I won't say there can't be exceptions to that. The nerf is likely due to ultimate level rating and the speed boost being too good at something. Or, you know, maybe because precision is needed. But generally, you want to focus on stuff that is doing lots of damage. 10% less damage on big hits is still good. It doesn't require standing in a bubble like Sacred Soil, and it has its own cooldown. And lasting 20 seconds? That can cover even the longest mechanics with multiple layers of damage. And same as everything else, what about trash pulls and dungeons? 20 seconds of 10% mitigation on the tank makes any and all enemies that much less threatening. Intentionally using the speed is entirely reliant on fights coincidentally giving you the use. Otherwise, you can't count on it being useful and just pretend it doesn't exist. Look for the two-for-ones, but don't count on them being common. I am still extremely down on this skill, but maybe you see something in it I don't? Personally, I'm just going to see it as Sonic cosplay for the rest of time. Thank you for watching this Scala 1-90 leveling skills guide. Feel free to give feedback or ask questions on what might still be confusing to you. I am always seeking to improve, as should you. Don't stop with this guide, even if I succeeded in helping you improve. Please leave a rating, comment, sub, those do really help creators. Or even go follow my Patreon. Have fun in your adventures across Eorzea, and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies.